Hi, everyone. It's Alex Savage from KTVU, Fox 2 News in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we want to talk about some of the latest headlines surrounding the coronavirus outbreak. And to do that, we bring in Dr. Vanila Singh, a clinical professor at Stanford School of Medicine here in the Bay Area, and also the former chief medical officer with the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Singh, good to have you. Great to be back. Thank you, Alex. Well, uh, Dr. Singh, I hope you had a, a nice, uh, relaxing Thanksgiving weekend uh, with, with your family. Uh, you know, I, I know a lot of folks uh, tried to enjoy the holiday as best they could, uh, given the circumstances here. But, but now as we all sort of come back to reality here uh, after the holiday break, there, there certainly uh, you know, is a lot of concern about kind of what, what people are looking at as potentially kind of a post-Thanksgiving coronavirus surge in cases on top of the surge in cases that's already happening in this country. Um, people obviously traveled. Some people obviously, you know, went and gathered with with loved ones in other parts of the country. What, what's your level of concern about uh, a, a, a surge in cases that we can directly attribute to the holiday? So it's great to be back. And yeah, Thanksgiving was wonderful. I I, I believe that, and I hope most people had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, the main thing is, of course, is the gathering that can happen and especially with people who are not in your usual pod, if you will, and also traveling interstate. I think that the travel uh, may have happened uh, and that could certainly be contributing to the surge that we're seeing right now. But I also say that we had predicted that this time of year would likely bring on an increase in cases if we didn't already have the vaccines. And uh, you know the vaccines are um, being produced with great uh, results as we know, but at the same time, winter is upon us. And these viruses in general are seasonal in nature. And so in many ways, this is what was predicted. And my hope is that with the measures that we're taking and the increased awareness, we're gonna be able to um, help at least stem the tide for now. What would be your best advice to someone who, who did decide that, look, they, they wanted to go see uh, loved ones, they wanted to go see relatives maybe who were in another part of the country, they got on a flight, they traveled to another city, they, they, they interacted and, and gathered and you know, had dinners with members of their family maybe or people who are outside of their household who they don't often see. What is your best advice to someone as they return back home? Is it, is it a good idea for them to quarantine? Should they go get tested? Yeah, so great question. I think a lot of people may be in this situation and maybe thinking about or not sure what direction to take. First and foremost is the travel that you had. I mean, certainly you abide by the state, the guidance of the airlines. So the airlines are uh, kept at a clean standard. But once you get into uh, another relative's home or somewhere else, who did you meet with? Were they folks who are out and about and potentially could have risk and therefore could have transmitted to you. And if that's the case, then you wanna consider either quarantining for 14 days, as that's usually the time allowed for the viral symptoms to um, start to show, or go and get tested. And if you're not sure about the answer to that, it's, it's definitely uh, worthwhile calling your doctor to see if in fact uh, they may consider that and, and write your prescription for it or direct you to where you can get a test done. Uh, for other folks, if you were, if you were seeing uh, relatives who are generally um, just uh, limited in their interactions outside of their home, then you're probably okay. And if you yourself are virtual at work and are also unlikely to uh, go and uh, interact with people, then you might be fine as well and sort of already are quarantining. But those questions, if they are in the gray area, I would definitely recommend a call to the doctor or to just seek out the test and get it done. Good advice, uh, certainly here, of course, because uh, as you well know, all across the country, cases are uh, increasing at really a, at an alarming rate in a lot of places. And the same thing is true here in California, where we are, where cases are certainly uh, trending in the wrong direction right now and, and causing a lot of concern for, for state leaders and for public health officials. Um, you, you, uh, I'm sure, heard uh, Governor Newsom today here in California saying that he is, because of the way the numbers are trending, he's considering reinstating that statewide stay-at-home order. I, I guess I should say, I should clarify, it would be for 
pretty much all of California, all the places that are in this uh, purple tier on the on the on the status uh, system for, for the reopening. But uh, in any case, essentially a statewide stay at home order, kind of taking us back to the early days of the pandemic here. Do, do you feel like, you know, with, with the fact that it's winter, you know, people traveling for the holidays and things like that, do you feel like here in California that is the direction we, we may be headed here to kind of I hate to use the term because, you know, people don't like it, but I mean, it's, you know, to lock things down once again. Yeah, you know, it's it's tough to uh, answer that. And I and I agree with you. I don't think people want to hear about the word uh, lockdown. On the other hand, what you mentioned, the key word is where are we trending? And the other key point is how are the hospitals looking? I think right now the concern that most are having is, is looking at what our um, – uh, state hospitals are uh, showcasing in terms of capacity. The ICU beds in particular are showing that they're about 75% utilized. And so if the trends were to con um, continue, we may reach capacity uh, by mid-December. So I, so I think these are the things that they're looking at. I'm sure they're also looking at alternatives. We've gone through this pattern in the spring when we were in fact uh, given uh, the US um, naval ships as added capacity if need be. And I think that all those things are um, on the table and being discussed with the governors and the coronavirus mm -hmm. task. Uh, however, it definitely does go to show that right now people should definitely take this seriously, institute all the measures that uh, we are so familiar with and that we're really in essence experts on now and not to take it lightly with with knowing that it might be a, a few more months before the vaccine is available broadly to the public. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it, it you know, it feels like those vaccines are getting closer here. We'll, we'll, we'll chat about the, you know, where, where we stand with those in a moment. But um, you talked about hospitalizations in California in particular, and the governor said today that the hospitalizations for COVID-19 are up 89% over the last two weeks in California. So, I mean, you, you see numbers like that, and, and yes, you have, you know, capacity, uh, capacity right now in the ICUs, but how, you know, how much longer, you know, when you, when you see uh, hospitalizations increasing at that kind of a rate, how much longer is it before you, you hit your max? Yeah, so I think that they're probably already planning on what to do if, in fact, uh, we uh, continue on this trend. We can predict, perhaps, that the ICU bed in particular capacity may be hit. And what do we do if, in fact, that happens? The building out the additional capacity is likely going on behind the scenes as we speak. And it is that time of year that it's not just COVID. I think about maybe 20 to 23 percent of the hospital beds uh, that are in the ICU are COVID-related. But People are getting pneumonia from community-acquired bacterial diseases or even flu-related. This is a season uh, of the year when, in fact, we see these cases go up. So that's why uh, it is of more critical concern. And additionally, the hospitalizations in general, I think we are generally better at treating people. We know better now what to do. For example, we used to um, more quickly intubate people, put the breathing tube in now, uh, they think before they do that because the um, outcomes, clinical outcomes of people are there. So though people are going into the hospitals and we are at an all-time high in terms of California hospitalizations, uh, the, the real hope is that we have a better uh, a, ability to appreciate when people need what treatment and how, how long they really have to be observed. So my hope is that that remains, but I'm, I'm certain uh, in all uh, aspects the planning behind adding additional capacity will be there and is already likely begun. Uh, but hopefully, in addition to that, we as individuals do our own part as well. Yeah, you, you, you plan for that worst case scenario, but you hope that uh, you hope you, you won't need all those extra beds, uh, you know, and you hope, you hope it doesn't get to that point. Um, all right, so that's the situation with, with the cases and, and where the cases are, how the cases are trending and which way, you know, we're seeing hospitalizations go in, in California. Um, you know, let's look big picture. And, and, and as we have, you know, continue to talk about here, there's a lot of hope on the horizon when we talk about uh, the vaccines. And just today, uh, here on Monday, uh, Moderna, 
applied for emergency use authorization for its vaccine that uh, was shown to be highly effective uh, against the coronavirus here. And then, of course, just last week, Pfizer did the same thing. So talk about what the next steps are for these two vaccine candidates here as they as they try to clear the, the, the regulatory hurdles. Yeah, so Alex, this is really continued good news in the vaccine front. For those people who aren't familiar, there are several U.S. Uh, endeavors, companies that have been uh, in the forefront of the vaccines. Uh, Pfizer, of course, getting the first application for federal uh, FDA uh, emergency use authorization, uh, uh, and they're waiting on that approval. Moderna is the company that uh, is sponsored and working with NIH, NIAID, the uh, division that Dr. Fauci leads. They began their uh, clinical trials back in March, and they've had excellent results. In fact, what I was most happy to see is that they are able to showcase 100% effect effectivity in keeping severe disease uh, and symptomatology with COVID, which is uh, amazing. That's in fact, yeah. they showcase those folks who got their vaccines um, versus 30, uh, so none of them had severe diseases versus 30 people in the uh, non-vaccine group developed severe um, symptoms. And th this, these are huge numbers. So very positive news there. And they, of course, are also uh, applying to the FDA with these high numbers of uh, efficacy. This would, I mean, on its face, I mean, to the average person like me, this, this would seem like a slam dunk when it comes to getting federal uh, approval for, for the use of these vaccines, emergency use authorization, right? I mean, is this as close as you get to a sure thing? What, what, what could possibly uh, derail the, the, you know, the application for emergency use? So, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think the um, scrutiny that these companies have been under their own personal uh, endeavor and uh, commitment to this has been very obvious as they've worked hand in hand with the federal government receiving resources, which is part of the Operation Warp Speed that has been touted and must be given uh, actual credit uh, to move this along at record speed. But it was really not safety and efficacy that were ever compromised, but in fact, bureaucracy. And usually it's resources that limit how fast things can move along. So it would be surprising to me if in fact, a major error was found to not be granted emergency use authorization. Having said that, you know, nothing is impossible, but these are two uh, companies with others on the horizon that are likely going to uh, certainly um, uh, get uh, at least vaccine in the first stages to the very critical populations. There's also the third of AstraZeneca with the University of Oxford, which also made some big news last week. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there is talk here, and I don't know if you agree that 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 first high priority group uh, in this country, right? We talk about the first responders, the the healthcare workers, um, and folks who work in uh, nursing homes and congregate settings and that sort of thing, getting the vaccine potentially by Christmas uh, here, if everything sort of goes according to plan. Is that is do you, do you think that's a realistic timeline? Well, you know, that's the hope. And, and I can say that uh, it was already in the news being reported today that United Airlines had brought the first shipments of the Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccine uh, from Brussels uh, to uh, Chicago. And uh, even though they're still waiting on the FDA emergency use approval, uh, what they are doing is something that has been the plan all along, which is to get uh, the clinical trials the distribution and the dissemination efforts in parallel. And so it is quite feasible uh, if in fact they have this laid out pretty well that at least with the Pfizer vaccine, their plan is to get it into four states. I believe it is Rhode Island, Texas, uh, Tennessee, uh, and New Mexico. Uh, but there's, you know, and, and uh, similarly, the plan would be for the other companies to do that so that they can uh, see it and uh, see it through in a very defined manner uh, so that they can get those. And, and then, of course, the other states, it'll be uh, much easier to understand what, what are the uh, blocks, where are the yeah. problems that might arise. You kind of take some test cases with, with some of those early states, right? And then, and then all the other states can sort of take note and figure out what were the biggest hurdles that they faced and the biggest challenges in terms of, because the storage and the distribution, I know we've discussed it before, but I, yeah, the storage and the distribution here, to me, just seem like they're going to be major, major hurdles, um, especially for the Moderna and, and the Pfizer, right, because of the cold temperatures. The Pfizer yeah. is the one that has to be stored 
Yeah, the yeah. Pfizer uh, vaccine is the one that does at this time require the, I think it's, I've seen varying reports, but uh, minus 94 minus degrees. 94, yeah. And, and so that infrastructure, I understand that the airlines have a deal with them in terms of how they're going to transport it. With, with the other vaccines, uh, it's likely that the way that the clinics and hospitals already have the capacity uh, for the requirements that, for those cold temperatures, but this is much colder than usual. I've also uh, understood that uh, Pfizer has tried to make it easy by allowing for it to come in certain packs. So we'll see how this all plays out. Okay. But one thing that is interesting is that when we think about how this uh, uh, virus has, uh, you know, we, we've had to study it and launch our approach to it, you know, early on uh, was in, something interesting, I think, for the viewers is that they are identifying that there was a variant, a mutation that happened early on in January out of Eastern China. That is actually why New York and Italy and other places uh, got infected so fast. So that it actually just tells you that the science has had to go hand in hand with all this knowledge. And these are interesting things because I, I definitely think we know the virus much better. We are definitely doing uh, the background understanding and hopefully, hopefully, we also get a genetic, genetic mutation in our favor that leads to an a, a attenuated, less uh, less uh, deadly virus. Okay. Yeah, we, we need to catch a few breaks. Um, yeah, that's absolutely what we need in this fight. So a um, lot of good news on the vaccine front, certainly. So we're, we're gonna keep our fingers crossed and, and hope that uh, things move along. Uh, and keep going in the right direction as, as they have been so far. So, uh, Dr. Singh, really good, as always, to have you on to break it all down. Dr. Vanila Singh, uh, clinical professor at Stanford School of Medicine and former chief medical officer with the Department of Health and Human Services. Always appreciate your time and your insights. Good to have you on here. I don't know what that noise was, but I appreciate you taking the time, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, Alex. All right, take care.